Ever since I was a little girl, I always dreamt of being an adventurous scientist. As I poured through back issues of National Geographic magazine that my parents had picked up for me from this little second-hand bookstall down the street, I dreamt of the day that my work would be so significant as to appear in glossy print. I would imagine myself diving to the depths of the ocean and coming face to face with creatures that no one else will ever see. I was born into an intense love affair with water. And it's not because I grew up in a family that did beach holidays or really has a strong affinity for water. But it's because I grew up in a family that valued exploration and adventure, whether it be through the mind or through an immersive experience. Being curious was the key. At the age of six, I had my first attempt at saving whales. <laughs> Needless to say, in the intervening years, I've learned a few things. I know that whales don't wear lipstick, <laughs> even though some of the cosmetics we wear today have whale parts in them. Exactly. And I also know that they're not menacing creatures with big, jaggedy teeth. But let me remind you, I grew up in a time before the internet and Google Images. I grew up in a country where TV was a luxury and featured repeats of Milli Vanilli and <laughs> Tina Turner. I grew up in Sri Lanka. Many people don't even know where Sri Lanka is, but to me, it's at my core. A beautiful tropical island located in the heart of the northern Indian Ocean, surrounded by about 20 times more ocean than land area. And yet, when I told people that I was off to university to study marine biology, many of them looked at me a little confused, crumpled up their faces and said, what are you going to do with that degree here in Sri Lanka? To me, it seemed fairly obvious. I mean, I come from a tropical island, it's surrounded by ocean, and I would carve out my niche if I had to. But where I come from, the expectation is that you grow up and become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, or a successful business person. Thankfully, that wasn't the case in my family. See, in Sri Lanka, the ocean is not seen as a recreational space, as it is here. It's actually a vocational space. That's where fishermen go to work. So it's not a wonder then that people were a little shocked that I would want to spend the rest of my life either in, on, or around the ocean doing a job that was like suspiciously like I was having way too much fun. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people have actually said to me that perhaps some point in my life I might want to get a real job. But I actually think that marine biology is one of those top all-time favorite dream jobs, given how many people have actually come up to me and said, you know, when I was young, I wanted to be a marine biologist too. The reason they didn't persist is often related to the fact that they didn't think it would make them pots of money. But to me, being able to spend hours on end sitting on the water, staring out of the horizon, looking for signs of marine life, or just being able to immerse myself in the cool waters and watch the swirling colors go by, and then call that a job, is pretty priceless. <laughs> Unfortunately, most people in this world see the ocean as a big blue tank of water without ever really taking a moment to peel off the top and look within. That's where the magic happens, and that's what I want the world to know. After all, three quarters of our Earth's surface is covered by oceans. 70% of the oxygen that we breathe is actually produced by plants in the oceans. That's over twice as much as the uh, oxygen produced by rainforests. Every one in five breaths that any of us takes comes courtesy of a tiny, microscopic plant that actually lives in the ocean. Three billion people are dependent on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods, and the ocean represents the greatest source of protein to the world. The ocean has supported the evolution of the largest animal that has ever roamed the planet, the blue whale, and also the animal with the largest brain on Earth, the sperm whale. 
The deep sea is often considered the greatest museum on our planet because it holds more remnants and artifacts of our history than all the world's museums put together. But yet, we've only explored less than 5% of the Earth's oceans. At the age of 18, I had to leave Sri Lanka and move to Scotland to go to university to pursue my dream of becoming a marine biologist. Now, that seems kind of crazy because I do come from a tropical island surrounded by water, but you know what? Marine biology is an unusual and untaught field. My country has literally a handful of marine biologists, and not all of them are very active. Driven by curiosity, a few years ago, I actually started the first ever long-term research project on blue whales in the northern Indian Ocean that I call the unorthodox whales. So the reason I call them that is because they actually break the stereotypes that we had put in place for this species. You know, textbooks used to tell us that blue whales or baleen whales, those are whales that have large comb-like structures in their mouths instead of teeth, would undertake these grand migrations between productive high latitude or polar feeding grounds and all the way to like low latitude breeding and calving grounds. But the ones in my waters, they don't undertake these polar migrations. In fact, they feed, breed, and carve in warm, tropical, equatorial waters. They speak a different dialect to blue whales in other ocean basins, including the ones that visit the shores of Monterey from time to time. They display different behaviors. And they're a teeny bit shorter than their Antarctic counterparts. But they are incredible animals. And they, like other organisms on this planet, represent an incredibly important component in a much more complex ecological web. Their conservation as top predators has broader biodiversity benefits with their presence or absence cascading through nature in very complicated ways. For me, the road has been one filled with challenges and it still is one filled with challenges. I've had international scientists approach me and ask me why I use such basic techniques or basic equipment to answer some of the questions that I ask. At first, I, I took this very personally, and, and it really upset me, because I really was setting out to do the best I could ever do. But soon I realized it was really just a reflection of the fact that they didn't understand what it was like to conduct this work in developing countries with minimal infrastructure, shoestring budgets, and the absolute need for innovation to succeed. Having a boat with a canopy is a rare commodity, so everything else is definitely luxury. It's not like I choose to weave tiny 21-foot boats amongst animals that are four times longer or the length of a basketball court, and try to avoid container ships that are at least 11 times longer than that. Because I know accidents do happen. But I do it out of necessity. The necessity to know more about a population of the largest animal that has ever roamed our planet and the oceans that they live in before it's too late. <laughs> People have also often questioned my place in the field on the basis of my gender. Coming from a South Asian country, I'm often subjected to questions such as, do your parents not mind what you're doing? <laughs> or, wait, my personal favorite, does your husband not care that you're getting black in the sun? <laughs> so, of course, my response to the chap who asked me this was, maybe it's a good thing I don't have a husband. And he said, very confidently, mind you, he said, I thought as much. <laughs> well, you know, I have been harassed, I have been threatened, and I have been called names. But I won't stop. I am fueled by curiosity, hooked on the saltiness of the ocean, and driven by this incredible promise of discovery. As we approach this age of open exploration, where basic tools are becoming more readily available, and citizen science is becoming a real thing. 
I think we're going to have to change our mindsets. I think we're going to have to accept that discoveries might not only come from scientists, but they might come from people who are passionate and have the capacity to throw together a homemade device. Does that then mean that that discovery is any less valuable than one backed by millions of dollars? I don't think so. I think it's actually an incredible age to be alive because if we as scientists can step out of our ivory towers, become more open in our communication, and share our knowledge, we have this chance to work alongside incredible innovators that can help us build the tools we need for cheaper, thereby making it more accessible to a larger part of the globe, which can only accelerate the rate of our discoveries about this vast ocean of blue. Harnessing the power and potential of everybody on this earth is an incredible way for us to actually increase engagement and awareness which can only really be a good thing for our oceans, but also for our very own future. I actually want to build a new model for the next generation of marine biologists. I want the world to be prepared and open-minded enough to accept that our next round of ocean heroes can come from any corner of the globe. My country, and indeed the developing world, is filled with talent, drive, and enthusiasm. And I want to pave the way because I am sick of people asking the same questions over and over again. And all I want is that they invest that energy in helping us to unlock the potential that lies within. I also want to inspire the next generation through my own work and dreams. To this end, I mentor students from around the world, and I also ease the nerves of frantic parents who aren't completely convinced about their child's choice of career. I um, feature stories and illustrations by children on my blog as part of my Future Ocean Heroes campaign. I do educational and outreach work, and I engage with the media. Because I actually believe the more we know the more responsible we feel, and the more likely we are to actually care. I actually think that there's so much potential that is untapped that we let leave on the wayside because of our strong, set ways. And it is time to change that. But coming from a community that has honed its skills to communicate supremely well with each other through um, inaccessible journal articles and scientific conferences, a lot of what I do is considered a waste of time. But to them, I say, if not for the likes of the explorers in National Geographic and people like Arthur C. Clarke or Jacques Cousteau, where would I be today? People also ask me, if I feel like I may have made some kind of difference in creating awareness about the oceans through my work. And I tell them, when the first documentary about my research went out um, four years ago, it immediately went viral. And it was incredible. I had outpourings of messages from people around the world writing in excitedly congratulating me and thanking me for what I'd done. To me, my favorites were from Sri Lankans who wrote in to say they didn't even know we had whales in our waters before seeing the videos. It's true. And the beautiful messages I got from young people around the world who wrote thanking me for helping them to realize they can live outside the box and that it's okay. And I actually think this is summarized really beautifully by one note that I got from someone and he said, you inspire us to be the change we want to see in the world, regardless of the biases the world places upon us. Thank you.